This is the first day of the May 92 five-day retreat in England. The topic for the first talk will be what it always is on any retreat and has been in the past. It is so important that it needs to be said always freshly. I don't feel it is a repetitive thing at all. We're looking at it anew and it is the problem of authority. And we will also talk about listening. What does it mean to listen? Putting our conventional ideas aside and really this moment exploring listening. Not just listening to a talk, but listening. And also to inquire into what is our relationship with each other. If we consider this whole problem of authority deeply look into it and have insight into it, then what is our relationship with each other in this retreat, but not just limited to this retreat. As human beings who may have different functions in life, as we all do, different parts of the body have different functions, <coughs> brain has different functions from the fingers or the liver, the eyes or ears. So some people in this life have functions of teachers. I want to be very careful with this word because I don't assume that identity. Functioning rather, let us not stick to a label of talking with people, out of looking and listening, and a profound feeling of friendship for each other, concern for each other. So is the function of people to talk and people to listen, people to teach mathematics, biology, medicine, art, <coughs> people to manufacture computers, buses, cars, clothing, function to represent people in government, the different functions. We don't have to begin to explore that. We, we know it. But what we often don't know deeply is that with the difference in function need not go difference of status, prestige, and attitude, identity. There's a very fine line between performing a function well, one's whole being involved in it, and then making something out of it in terms of an image. I am this and therefore uh, all kinds of uh, respect or awe or admiration is due to come to me or to you. So can we function in this life of different functions with great simplicity? Doing what we're doing with our whole being, but not creating images about it which then begin to lead a life of their own, affecting our senses, our perceptions, our expectations. We don't see each other anymore as human beings, but as higher and lower, better and worse. We 
when the President of the United States enters a news conference, every single last reporter gets to his feet. Gets up. They don't bow, but it's, it is that kind of a change. Somebody, somebody else says, his press secretary comes up, nobody gets up to their feet. Person who cooks for him, people wouldn't probably even see her or him. Wonder what is he doing here? Likewise, when I was still under the image projected onto me and adopted by myself as a spiritual teacher, people were bowing and prostrating to me. And the function wasn't any different, but things happen between us and our brain. When such extras take over having to do with image, which affect our the directness and friendship and love of our relationship. If something comes in between an idea and what what behavior this idea elicits traditionally. Can one look at that as these conditioned habitual behaviors want to arise, want to take over and be aware of it, not do anything about it. Awareness is enough in itself. An awareness that does not judge, does not say, now I should do this because I've seen that. It's not necessary. To see is its own clear action, if the seeing is clear. So, having said this, how do you see me? How do I see you? What do you, what do you project onto me? from what you've heard, from what you have read, from how you have responded to people who have had a similar function in your life. We habitualize a response so quickly that it becomes automatic and compelling to respond in this way, to bow, to think of superior and inferior, to classify ourselves and each other, and therefore impede our perception. Cloud the clarity of perception. A little baby with big eyes, as little babies usually are, everybody says, well, doesn't your baby have big eyes? Most babies have big eyes because they're not afraid yet. They don't think this is the president and this is a, a, a reverend or a spiritual teacher. They look at everyone alike with the same big eyes, trying to pull at the buttons of a suit or pull off the glasses if you pick up the baby. No matter whether you're pope or the highest functionary in whatever tradition, doesn't affect the baby's relationship with you. May be sensitive to other things, but not the idea of what you are or, or what he or she is. That has not yet distort, begun to distort and affect and cloud behavior, perception, relationship. In this past retreat here, I don't know how long ago, a week ago or so in Sweden, up in northern Sweden, there was a person who has coming, been coming to retreat for many, many years, usually when I go to Germany. A person who's easily depressed, nervous, down on himself. Not much hope forever changing, 
And yet, he's always come back, always happy to see him and he's back. In this hard, difficult work of looking at oneself in silence and allowing anxiety and nervousness and fear and depression to arise. And usually he says, I, I love to come to these retreats, but I don't much understand what you're talking about. Not really deeply I understand the words, the meaning of them, but not the depth of openness. And on one morning in a meeting with bright eyes, quite more open than usual, he said, this morning I stepped out of the, out of the cabin and everything appeared as though I was looking at it with the eyes of a newborn baby. Is that what you mean by seeing? Is that what you're talking about? The night before he had canceled the meeting because he felt so angry, so upset, just went to sleep. And for who knows why, I don't and I don't think anybody does, in the morning the eyes were open to see without, without all the accumulated stuff that we live with all the time that is sort of wired and programmed into our whole system. The whole body is programmed and wired with a past. And that's where the energy usually travels. But looking at something freshly, newly, the energy may not travel in this network of the past, but just be there, here, now, in a simple way. Unpretentious, without imagery about what I am, what you are, what I should become or should be. Looking for oneself, as it were, but not the idea of it. No authority in that kind of looking. No scriptures, no prayers. It's just the looking and the joy of the depth of joy of it. The holiness of it, if you will, but not the idea of holiness. The wholeness of it. So coming back to authority. Is what is being said here heard as though it came from the mouth or heart experience of an authority. You will listen differently if that is the idea than if both you and I put that idea aside. We see what it does, what it is, and just listen to what somebody in this room says, not to become an authority or a an expert, but to, to look together. Someone is, is verbalizing in a fairly clear way what is going on in human beings, because it is happening in this human being too. The whole process of image formation is there in human beings. The brain has that capacity doesn't have that capacity in most animals and therefore they live more peacefully with each other because they don't remember ad infinitum what this doe or that deer did in the past or said <laughs> and tells its children to revenge that, avenge that in future generations of deers. That capacity isn't there, that capacity is here, it's not our fault. This has evolved not because we wanted it or asked for it, it has evolved in human beings. And since the, the first 
one-celled organism and before the evolution of a brain to function, to survive, to perceive, to regenerate and in human beings, maybe in some of the so-called higher animals, to think, to form images. And one of the images is the image of authority. I'm not saying that there are not authorities on mathematics and biology and computer science and medicine. In this case, meaning accumulation of a vast body of knowledge and retention of it and the ability to quickly draw on the files and, and explain it or make it explicit. This is not what we're doing here. I'm not imparting knowledge. There are spiritual traditions, many spiritual traditions, where part of the functioning is to impart knowledge, intellectual knowledge. This is not what this is about. The talk is not here to convey knowledge but to invite to look at what is happening in human beings like you and me who are representative of human beings all over the world past through present into the future to look what's happening as we think of somebody as an authority we were just talking about it the other night at a friend's house How it's very likely that we listen differently to a person who we think is an authority than to each other, not thinking that we are authority, authorities. The listening may change. That's why so often it's said in the presence of a great teacher, all kinds of things happen to me. I have to be in the presence of this great teacher. Maybe what's happening, one of the most important things is that the, heart and mind opens up to listen and to each other where there isn't this concept of authority or respect, veneration. We don't listen. We have other images. He doesn't know what he's talking about. It's not worth listening to her. Not that we say it to ourselves, but we behave that way. It, it comes instantaneous. We listen to the image and not be controlled and overpowered by it so that the listening frees itself from imagery, ideas and their reactions. Not to listen to a talk and write a reading thing down so one can, can repeat what an authority in quotations say, but as the talk proceeds to, to proceed with it, to move along in listening together. I'm also listening, not talking from memory. I don't know how many times this talk on authority has been given, but I don't think any two of them have been alike. It doesn't come from a repetitive scheme. I don't think about it before the talk starts in openly looking and listening, things reveal themselves and can be, can be put into words, which the memory supplies. The brain can be very cooperative when the mind is open in looking, and then the brain will supply a word or an, or an example, a past episode. May, which may illustrate that which is being looked at right now. It's just accessed and used. It, it's not that memory controls this talk, a memorized talk, or memorized scriptures, memorized sayings of authorities. We 
doesn't mean one cannot pull out a book and read it. Not think this person is an authority, but listen to what he or she is saying and looking inwardly, openly, curiously, like a newborn baby. A newborn baby doesn't look inward at image formation. It doesn't do that. has no problems with it yet. It looks outward and its own body, playing with the toes trying to suck on the big toe. So is it possible for these five days to listen in a new way, not taking what is said as something that should be remembered or compared to what one remembers other people in this function have said, but freshly looking openly, maybe seeing or not seeing what is being said, but not concerned of, with grasping it. The, the openness of ka that's the openness. Twittering of birds. Maybe some sensations in the body, energy circulating or blood circulating, whatever it is, who knows. listening to this unfathomable process of breathing, which we don't know how it happens. If there's this openness of listening and not having an idea, I should, should watch it from my nostrils on down to the diaphragm and back up. And not knowing what this is, maybe there is some inkling that the whole body is breathing in an unfathomable way. So not to make the breath do this or do that, become yogic, deep, whatever, all these ideas we have put into the mind by authorities. Not know what the breath should be like and allow it to become maybe natural again, appropriate to each moment. The little tiny babies breathe. If you, if you watch them, their belly goes up and down. Not because someone has told them about Hara. It does. It's, it's, it's how, how this muscle functions. It's only with time and all kinds of things that happen. Commands and punishments and rewards and anxiety arising. And what anxiety is arising in the lives of babies these days and children? It's unfathomable. In war zones and famine zones, terrorist zones, with that, the breathing moves sort of upward, becomes tight. Until for the most unfortunate ones, the asthma develops. I don't mean asthma that is caused through certain allergies which may have, have no psychological basis, but the asthma of fear, not getting a breath, not being able to breathe and the feeling of oppression, things ang anxious. So to not manipulate the breathing, maybe for five days, maybe you have done it and have become habituated to it. I'm not saying drop it, if you do what you need to do or think you need to do, but just mentioning it. It's possible to listen to the breathing without having any, any idea of what to do with it, how it should be, not knowing what this is. So dropping the word breathing, I'm just using it because we're communicating with each other 
But one doesn't have to label things for oneself. That way the brain can calm down in its, all its extra functions and just take care of this organism, which is its intelligent function, in ways which again are, will never be completely known because they involve everything, all our past, all the present, this entire universe, as part of us, we're part of it, we're not separate, not standing outside of it, which the brain allows us to think we are doing. The brain, with its projection of imagery about me, allows this error to be taken for truth that we are separate, independent individuals. Charged with, with, with imposing authority on others. And not knowing what we're doing. Because it takes more than imagery more than thinking, no matter how deep and sophisticated, it takes more than imagery and thinking to have insight into the process of image making and thinking. One can understand it quite clearly intellectually, and yet there's no insight into it. And I'm not putting down the importance of also intellectually understanding what is going on. And yet, can there be here and there an insight into the limitation of intellectual understanding? Just understanding its importance, because if the intellect does not understand something clearly, it produces continuous false ideas, superstitious systems of thought, false beliefs, and hopeful faith, and so forth. But to directly perceive the arising of an image as not a thought, it's, it's as, as immediate and palpable as the singing of a bird when the mind is open. You see the arising of an image about Tony and the, the, the reaction. People tell me if they sit in a waiting room, wherever, whatever country, it doesn't matter. Maybe before their turn, coming up or entering into a room, the heart pounds. There's a certain nervousness coming, coming up. Some people who have worked, we've worked together for maybe 10 years. We're, we're friends with each other. Really, really friends, not just the word friends, but friends, close. But in sitting there, all of a sudden an image arises because the brain is an associative organ, associates this situation with past situations, with past situations, and all the emotions that accompanied past situations are evoked when this present situation does that. So one has a fearful feeling, anxiety and heart, heart pounding because of waiting, who knows, where outside of a schoolmaster, headmaster's or mistress's office, or a doctor who may give an injection, or a priest or, or guru who may test one or uh, reproach one or praise one. The expectation of it, all that is there. That can be watched, it can be observed. And even though the whole body may already be triggered to manifest its symptoms. That doesn't handicap 
That doesn't handicap us really very much. It'd be nicer if the heart was calm, but if it's not calm, one walks up the stairs and into the office or into the uh, room with a, with a pounding heart and some nervousness in the throat. That tap is happening like, hoo, hoo, hoo. it's all happening. We need not be a victim of this, meaning thinking about what's happening. This is where our trouble starts. What's happening is one thing, and to feel it, live with it, is simple. But to think about what's happening, that becomes a new input, which is much more powerful than the actual happening of something being associated and the heart pounding. It's felt, heard, and that's it. But to think, oh, will I now be functioning well? How will she hear me? Will I make a fool of myself? It always happens to me, says the headlines. Why can't I be as calm as so-and-so? It may not even be true. So-and-so may be just as agitated, but not show it. So can we watch the storyline, sometimes I call it the headlines, the editorials that are going on all the time in the brain about what's happening. And to appreciate, by appreciate I mean to, to really see how the power of that on this organism and on the perception, on the senses. The, the narrowing of the field into a very tight quarters of what I tell about the event and the reactions and then the, the, the desire to break out of the narrowness or hit back. It all started by not just living what's happening, painful or joyful, but thinking about it and then reacting to what, is, what the story incites in this organism. So how, how do we listen to ourselves, to each other, to a person who sits in front of one with a microphone? The question has been put, now we need to look. Not just answer it all. The other day somebody said, oh, I don't think much about myself anymore. That's gone. We'd brought up, you know, how so quickly if one sits in, in a quiet place, thoughts come up, how well am I doing, or I'm doing poorly. Or just something about I, something about me. Maybe very, very deep, very shadowy. A particular person said, oh, this doesn't happen to me anymore. I wouldn't say that ever. I would be open to look. Because if you think it's not happening, the door is closed. The window is shut. But if you wonder what's happening, and maybe, maybe there is some deep shadowy feeling of being something, somebody. Maybe not so deep and shadowy, very, very palpable on the surface. But never to assume anything about one's present state of being, based on the past. Because then the door shuts and we live on memory of what was and project what will be in the future. So, listening right now without knowing, listening without knowing. And therefore, looking, attending. When we don't know, the, the, the world is open. 
And I don't mean the, the not know where I hope the next moment somebody will tell me. Or I'll go to a book and read it. Because I hate the state of not knowing. It makes me feel so uncertain and insecure. That's how we've been raised. We've been raised as knowers from very early times. Knowing has been rewarded. And not knowing has been punished, ridiculed. humiliated. A woman who comes to, to spring water has been coming for a long time. She went through medical school and then became a resident. <coughs> and one of the first rounds that she was taken as with, with the higher ups, the more advanced residents and whoever all was in that group She came to a patient and talked with a patient, and the patient told her symptoms. And she said, I don't remember this verbatim, but somehow she conveyed that she didn't know right now what was, what was ailing this person. And she said for two hours in, in a committee room she was bombarded with indoctrination, never ever to say that again as a doctor. That was the, the worst thing that a doctor could say to a patient. I think it's the best thing to share in not knowing and explore together. And there is a new movement of, of doctors to more be on the, on the level of the patient, not thrown there as the authority almost God-given authority. Who knows, and really doesn't know. <laughs> she was saying the truth. Even this whole committee full of experts probably didn't really know. We guess with our best guesses. <clears throat> and then, well, I don't have to go into all of that. So, but I'm coming back to not knowing. Here no one will lambast you or debunk you when you say, I don't know. And it depends also, the, the whole quality of this, I don't know. I can feel it, how somebody says this, I don't know, whether it's demanding an answer, or putting oneself down, or the, the openness of, of not knowing, and allowing things to reveal themselves on their own. in the presence of this not knowing, which is not exerting a pressure on oneself or the environment or the other person. It's inviting to, to look and listen freshly. Can we do that at times, this retreat, alone and together? If we do, then what is our relationship with each other? I will tell you as best as I can what my relationship is with you. It is not one of teacher-student. I don't consider anybody who has worked with me or is working with me as my student. This to me is totally meaningless. We come together to, to work together, to look and listen together. I do more talking than you, maybe. But that's the function at this moment. Tomorrow you may do more talking than I. But the relationship is one of friendship, closeness, not imagery of what you are, and or even worse, of what you should be or should become through this relationship. This is, this is absent from this mind. 
I'm interested in what's going on right now in human beings, like you and me. And that exploration can take place alone and together. Yes. It's different. And both have their place. Just a few things about where the topics for the talks in a retreat such as this are coming from. They're coming from you and me. I write if I get a chance and remember. I write down questions that people bring up in meetings, group as well as individual. Some I forget. I never be, I'm, I'm never able to write it down verbatim. I cannot remember exactly how the question was put, and maybe you can't either. If you do and you find that your question has been changed, it's not been done in any manipulative way, I just write down what seems a pregnant question or good for exploration even though it may not be verbatim what you said. Also, it so happens very often that many different people on one day ask very similar questions. So I don't write down all of these similar questions, but make one question out of it. If in a private meeting you bring something up that you would not like to hear talked about in a public talk such as this, please let me know and I will not. Also, do not reveal names, of course. This remains anonymous whose question it is, except when it comes from a group meeting. There is no anonymity there. Anyways, we, we do meet openly. We don't have blindfolds on. Sometimes we do. Also, over the years, it has developed that people have become interested in all the questions that I have had time to write down, even though not all of them may enter into the talk. So I do this at the beginning of a talk, read everything I've written down, because it gives us a feeling of what our problems are, and some people can make it uh, more explicit what someone else feels more implicitly. And it's helpful to hear somebody has put it into words. Sometimes that really helps us to see something. Not just the clarity of the description, but seeing something directly that has been clearly described by someone else and listened to openly. If you don't agree with what I'm saying, the way I'm putting it, the words I'm using, please bring it to a meeting, group or private. You're not expected to agree with me. There are always some people who are very uh, good at challenging what is being said. That's very helpful to, to aerate the soil, break up the clumps, let some air in, not just accept everything smoothly, challenge it or question it. Or you may say, I did not follow what you said. Could you go over it again? I cannot go over verbatim. I don't remember what I'm saying an hour or a day later. But we can look at it anew. We don't need those old words anymore. We can find new ones. Or maybe the same ones will come up again. We'll see. Or you may want to take something further, ask 
another question about it. So this is what meetings are for. Not solely. Sometimes people have stayed away from a meeting because they have not had a question or have not had a question about what was brought up in the talk. If you feel like coming to a meeting and have no plans, no uh, idea yet of what is going to come up, then we are on the same level. I have no idea what's going to come up either. Or just sit together listening and looking. Quietly or something will come up. Yesterday, I forgot to mention, there's a little, a little clock, a digital clock sitting on the table next to, next to us. Sitting in a little bit poor position, the t- table is behind me, so I have to turn around to look at the time, which I don't like to do because it, it gives the feeling also from past impressions and I'm not interested anymore in what you say, and I'm turning, saying, my God, what time is it? Why? Well, I wish it was over. So people sometimes have felt hurt when I've looked at the clock. I don't blame anybody for it. It's all our conditioning. Feeling a person is abandoning me, or interested in the next person, or I'm not interested, interesting enough. All of this stuff is there for observation. Not just for reveling in it, and, or depressing in it, but to see it. To be wise about how this mind operates. But if both you and I could watch that clock occasionally, it's certainly at the beginning, and then one gets a feeling for about 10 minutes, and then look again. So it's not just me doing this, we're both doing it. And then we're in the same boat together. And both of us ending the meeting. That doesn't come from me, that again sort of is, a, is as though I was the authority on how long this meeting should be. We will end here for today.